I'm Ben with the BTC Sessions, your source for decrypting cryptocurrency. Today I'd like to bring to you an interview I had with somebody by the name of Robert Galarza, the CEO and director of Blockstrain Technology. They are marrying the cannabis industry with the blockchain industry in a very interesting way. We get into a variety of topics here, a lot of current events, uh, including the SEC's statement on what constitutes a security when it comes to cryptocurrencies and ICOs. We talk a little bit about Coinbase adding Ethereum Classic, and we get into what Robert has been up to with his company. Without further ado, here's my interview with Robert Galarza. Hello everyone, I'm Ben with the BTC Sessions. Uh, I am here to chat a little bit of current events. I've got a special guest, uh, his name, he's the CEO of Blockstrain Technology. Uh, his name is Robert Galarza. Am I saying that right, Galarza? Uh, you sure are, Ben, absolutely. Awesome, well thank you so much for being with me today. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, um, I, I just, you know, while I have you here, I was hoping to chat about a variety of things. Um, lots of stuff going on in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space. Uh, recently, this past week, we had the SEC chairman uh, coming out uh, on TV saying that uh, Bitcoin is not a security and that cryptocurrencies that are designed to replace um, regular fiat currencies are not securities and they're not worrying about them. And what they are focusing on is ICOs. Did you see this as, as a pretty fair and logical step? You know, I, I, we really did. I mean, uh, I will, we'll discuss a little bit about where, you know, where our technology plays in terms of uh, block, blockchain tech itself, but a little background on my, myself, my, my partner has been a you know, design developer, technology, enterprise software developer for 20 years. Uh, but my background was actually I was a, I was a lawyer in a previous life, so I you know forgive me for that. But <laughs> what it what it did give me is it gave me an understanding of of some of the challenges we face in the cannabis industry and legalization, as well as some of the challenges that are being faced in the in the in the blockchain and cryptocurrency sector. And one of those things is is, is relates to capital raising, right? And when you're raising capital, uh, that's the big issue, right? If you're raising capital from something, uh, that's kind of the whole concept of what securities law has been put in place for is basically protecting investors. So I think that's that's the, the big challenge of like where the ICO market went out and they were able to aggregate, you know, what basically looked like investment capital, even if it was structured in a digital manner, uh, which is, is tricky. Um, what we what we've heard in terms of the conversations we've been having with the, the regulatory bodies is is just to that effect is that you know Bitcoin itself was you know there's never a capital raise, never a value set on it when it was put in the market. Uh, it organically grew on its own. Uh, to be a mechanism with which you could exchange, right? And that's really what we believe uh, is the power of cryptocurrency. So uh, it, for us, I think it's a step in the right direction for you know, making sure that we're allowing good actors to come in this space and create you know, great technological advancements to help move, move uh, you know, at the end of the day, move barter you know, goods and services. That's what we want to be able to use this stuff for. We just want to do it internationally. So it's, uh, it's, I think it's a step in the right direction. Awesome, awesome. Now, what was curious about when he was chatting, uh, he was directly asked about um, Ethereum because there was a capital raise there. But the, the other issue is, is that it, it's become very, very decentralized and, and probably very difficult to regulate in any way. You could look to maybe the Ethereum Foundation, but um, the, you know they at this point probably only have so much power to suggest things but, but the community's got to decide so how do you think they're grappling with that yeah i, I think you know it, in my opinion i think it, a little bit of this has to do with i mean part of it does come from the capital raising perspective of, of where the launch was but i think also one of the challenges uh, and this is just by by way of what's happened over the past year is a lot of the companies that came out that are being highly criticized and you know oftentimes being prosecuted were ERC-20 tokens, right? They were doing it on, on the backbone of Ethereum. Um, and that, that, that's tough, right? So it's hard to just say, you know, hey, we're, you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna say Bitcoin, you're, you're good. 
we're going to say, you know, if you're the regulatory body, then you're going to kind of put your arm around Ethereum as well. When in turn, you're kind of having to prosecute against a lot of people that use uh, use the infrastructure for for their, you know, their tokenization and their ICOs um, that were, you know, now are being scrutinized as being, you know, illegal securities fraud. Yeah. So, so essentially, there may be down the line, a differentiation between, even though it did have a capital raise, the infrastructure being used versus the projects being launched on that infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And again, I think that it's a bit of a moving target. The, the regulatory bodies, you know, they're, they're, they're always slow to adjust to new technologies uh, because they're trying to take you know, old mechanisms they're used to and implement them into new infrastructure. But they're, you know, at the end of the day, they're, they're working on behalf of, of the people, right? And working on behalf of protecting people. And I think that's, you know, that, that's where we, you know, companies and entrepreneurs, we need to make sure we understand that so we can work together to try to put our, put our systems in line with what their, you know, our overall mission, our mission from a capitalistic perspective, and then their mission from a, from a public policy perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, I'm going to segue a little bit from that, uh, but still on kind of the Ethereum train here. Um, Coinbase just announced that it added Ethereum Classic, which was the fork from uh, uh, Ethereum. Uh, well, depending on which way you look at what the original <laughs> chain is, but but regardless, it's it's a a split of Ethereum. So if Ethereum is split into Ethereum and Ther- Ethereum Classic, um, Ethereum has been on Coinbase for quite some time, and there didn't seem to be any real rush to get Ethereum Classic onto the platform, um, which was a bit in stark contrast to when Bitcoin split into Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. Uh, that was added very very quickly. Um, and not to mention that uh, a lot of people were really pining for them to add Ripple, um, given that it's third in, in market cap. What is your thoughts on on this add of asset to Coinbase? Yeah, I, I you know it's it was, and again it's it's so tricky to, to know exactly what what Coinbase is uh, you know their their particular policies or or their particular uh, you know in terms of their decision making, but. You, you know, one one could guess that, uh, you know, conversations are happening behind the scenes, whether it be from, you know, oversight or whether it be from ease of use or uh, what they what they believe could be the future trajectory of the, of the particular currency in terms of its use cases. Um, but again, all that, to my, you know, for me, it's all a bit of, a bit of conjecture and uh, guessing. So I'm always a little cautious to go too deep on uh, what, what these guys are thinking uh, when they're when they're putting their processes in place, you know? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So um, I want to actually, while I have you here, um, I was going to ask, because you've got an interesting project going um, and, and you're doing <laughs> kind of a marriage between cannabis and, and blockchain technology. Um, and we're both, we're, we're in Canada where uh, we're dealing with basically the legalization for recreational use of, of marijuana and cannabis um, coming up pretty quick here. And so I, first, yeah. I'll touch on kind of the cannabis questions here. So in a month, a uh, month or so, we're going to see the end of cannabis prohibition. Um, what kind of benefits are we going to see from this incoming shift? And are there any drawbacks or things to consider with this? Yeah, yeah, I think I think, the you know, at the outset, everyone is excited about, you know, the evolution of, of our industry and, and being able to provide medicine to patients and a product to consumers that, uh, it, you know, is, I think a lot of people have been wanting this for a long time, you know, c- culturally, we, we've shifted and changed a lot. I think the, the, so obviously, the benefits are, you know, the access to product, keeping it out of the hands of kids, you know, getting away from the black market, being able to create, you know, tax, good tax revenues. We've seen states like Colorado, I'm actually at the Denver airport right now, and this market's definitely tried as a result of it. Um, you know, but the challenges that, that we're going to face and one of the things that the reason we've developed our company and what we focus on is the need to create a system of, of validation um, and verification and visibility. Right. Um, you know, the key for us is trying to, to put good, good product in the hands of consumers and, and be able to eliminate bad actors. Um, we're us- utilizing our technology to do that. Um, and, and, and you know, but that's the thing. I think as long as there's a market opportunity for growth and, and the capitalism comes to play, um, you know, as we've seen in California, right, legalization opened up and, you know, people entered the market and it, it blew up. Um, and, and then people were thinking they were getting good product. And, you know, I, I read a case about a guy in California that literally was uh, consuming this product for medical use from a legal grower, um, but he kept getting sicker and sicker. 
and he sent his product in to be tested on his own independently. And it, w- it came positive w- for a pesticide that although relatively innocuous when you, when, when, when you consume on a- other agricultural products, if combustible, it converts into cyanide. So he was oh. inhaling cyanide through his medicine, right? So I think that's, the, that's where the balance of, of you know, open market and, uh, and regulation need to come into play. And that, that's really what we're trying to do is, is help, uh, help create that, that, that um, verification system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a little scary to hear given, <laughs> given, uh, you know, right? he was going from, uh, so, yeah. yeah, wow, wow. Um, so do you, do you see our incoming legislation as maybe part of what will become a larger trend? Do you think that this is going to start to take hold around the globe in other countries? Do you think that the U.S. is, is I know that state by state it differs, but do you think that pretty soon they're, they're going to be following suit with Canada? Yeah, I, I, I sure do. And, um, you know, we're already starting to see it on an international level with, with other countries starting to move forward. And, you know, I, I saw a recent study that 86% of the U.S. Uh, the general population is approves of medical marijuana legalization. Uh, not everyone necessarily approves of recreational, but they, they all have, we have all agreed that, you know, we have a medicine out there that can help people. And when you're in, when you have an opiate crisis, like we do in the U S and Canada and the fentanyl crisis, like you do in, in U S and Canada, and we have a mechanism to be able to combat that through a natural medicine. Um, it just makes sense that this is going to evolve into the market opening up. Um, and we believe, we, knew, we believe that's the case. But here's the, here's, the, here's the real catch. As we've seen in markets like California and, the, and, and other markets in the U.S., and my, myself, my partner, originally from California, uh, when we, entered in, we were in this sector, if you don't build mechanisms to be able to create safe legal products and verified, and you don't reward good actors for good business practices for consumers, then what you do is you, you, you end up hindering regulators' ability to be able to open up the, the doors, right? So you, you got to create a system that's safe and legal, and not just legal, but safe in order for this thing to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, I, I, you're, you're talking about using blockchain technology in, <laughs> uh, in cooperation with, with the cannabis side of things. Now, what I wanted to touch on quickly before we get into specifically how they're helping you, um, I want to get your thoughts on where is blockchain useful and where is it not? Like, what, what is being disrupted here? Because I'll, you hear a lot of, like, let's slap a blockchain on it. You know, you had a lemonade company that added blockchain to their name and they, their stock went up. So, so what is blockchain actually useful for? You know, in, in our opinion, where blockchain comes into play is when you're dealing with voluminous amounts of, of administrative uh, data and, and you're needing verification security and, and rapid, rapid um, access to that data and, and that, that, that information. At the end of the day, blockchain is essentially, a, a, and our company is essentially a, a big data play and married with blockchain technology for its greatest and, and, and best use in kind of in the supply chain sector. And I think we've already started to see that. I mean, one of the things that, that we've really seen uh, come to the forefront is companies like IBM and, and then the Walmart, the FedEx of the world that they, they, they exist in supply chain, Amazon, you know, they really are starting to understand that th- these solutions, these systems can, can really create incredible efficiency within a system that usually has a massive amount of administrative uh, burden on it. Right? So that's really an area that we focus on and, and, and an area that we believe where, you know, we're enterprise software developers. So for us, it's developing... Uh, you know, developing a proprietary platform that utilizes blockchain uh, rather than just saying, hey, we're just another company that's blockchain, right? That, that it's, it's having a way to be able to use, use the systems for being able to, to fix problems in the industry. Now, now, the name of the game with blockchain technology seems to be disruption, the idea of, of removing middlemen. So, so in this instance, who is the blockbuster? Who is the Kodak here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, for us, uh, in, I, mean, it, it, I guess it, it depends. I mean, for, you know, we have seen the Kodak, you know, uh, uh, being able to utilize the tech for, you know, we, we think it's a pretty, pretty great use case, right, in terms of licensing proprietary, you know, photos and sharing, et cetera. It's a really cool use. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we work with, with the team that, that uh, was part of that, and it's, it's super exciting to be at the forefront of that. Um, you know, I think, I think industries that are going to come, come about and start to look at, um, you know, Again, it's, it's all about rapid data, right? It's rapid data, you know, and exchange. So I think trade is definitely going to be an interesting when you when you look at like global trade 
Um, when you look at, you know, companies that are starting to do, you know, um, you know, transactions, between, uh, global transactions between parties, it could be anything from you know, companies that are, you know, doing international imports, exports, which could definitely be an interesting area too. So uh, I'm not sure exactly who's going to be the big winner at the end of the day on the on block. I, I think at the end of the day, every company that implements it, does it well, is going to win as a result. Um, for us, we, we definitely see, you know, what we were able to use it for is, is when you have a system where you really need to create trust. Um, in our industry, it was, you know, we were an industry that came from the shadows and we're pulling this company, this industry out of the shadows into the light. And so it becomes that much more imp important for us to create a system that allows uh, trust uh, in terms of the, the data that's going back and forth. Yeah. It's very interesting that you're saying pulling it into the light because there's this misconception, especially around cryptocurrency, that it's this weird um, you know, hidden, obscured thing like Bitcoin. Uh, but, but in reality, like a blockchain, technically it's, it's, it's open. It's, you know, people can see it. It's accessible to others. So, so by you're saying that by using, um, this blockchain technology, it's, it's going to create, um, I, I guess more transparency in, in your sector. We, we believe so. I mean, and, and obviously not only information is going to be going to be on the blockchain with which we utilize it, right? It's a bit of a marriage of centralized and decentralized systems together. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you're exactly right. I mean, uh, I think that the, the downside to the, the latter part of the year when the ICO market did what it did was it started to, to pull people away from the, the incredible benefit of having a digital global currency system that could be completely immutable decentralized with built on trust and built on real trust. Um, and, and every, you know, every innovation goes through it, goes through it. It's uh, growing, you know, growing pains. And, you know, I know Silk Road is definitely a major growing pain for, for Bitcoin. Um, I think we all know that we all, we all um, accept that and, and understand that. Um, you know, the, I think similarly, the ICO boom and bust was very similarly for all cryptocurrency was a bit of a, a bit of a growing pain along the way. Um, but the exciting part is, uh, you know, the, when you look at us being a global world, you know, in a global world, that's kind of redundant, but being a global marketplace and, and wanting to be able to, um, you know, communicate with people around the world and have ease of transactions and understanding that, you know, there's certain middlemen that just are, are becoming bigger problems in the industry in terms of efficiency. And, and it's not about replacing jobs. It's just about trying to make the system better so that those, the people that would be pushing that paper can maybe be using their talents to, to better serve the industry at large. I mean, you know, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the big, that's the exciting part of where the tech comes in. Now, can we get into a little bit more detail of, of how your company works, what, what your goals are? So how you said that blockchain is primarily being used as, as a way to uh, basically keep tabs on the supply chain for your, for your product. Is that correct? Yeah, it's very, very much so uh, implemented within that infrastructure. So the mission for our company, and my, my partner, Tommy Stevenson, and myself, uh, we've been you know, we've been in this industry for a number of years. Tommy's actually been developing tech for about seven years. Uh, he was the CTO for a company called Ghost Group in California, which owns Weed Maps, amongst many other uh, systems. And, you know, got to really got to, to uh, you know, get, get part of this industry uh, in, 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 the gen, in its genesis in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And work with those great guys down there and what they're trying to do to innovate, you know, their technologies and provide systems for consumers and brand awareness uh, for, 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 brand, for you know, producers of product, which is cool and really exciting. Uh, for us, what we, what we saw as one of the bigger problems in the industry was this transparency and verification of product, right? Every time a, a new hot product would hit the market, because there's no real IP protections in place, you would have 50 other growers growing the same, you know, uh, blue dream or the same, you know, same trade name and mm -hmm. packaging it as similarly as you could. And all it did was create confusion for the market. And for anybody trying to consume, you know, you want consistency. You want to know what it is you're putting in your body. And you want to know that when you start the process of, you know, when you start the process of like going and, and trying something new and unique and you need it for a particular ailment, you want to make sure that it does, it is what it says, right? And so for us, the whole system was built upon verification and validation of product. And the way we did that is, and what we love about the Canadian market is it's built on testing. So we, we, we intersect together, we join with the laboratories on the testing side, we have a validation mechanism, utilizing blockchain to be able to create that immutable record for, for, for IP protection for the growers, as well as validation for the consumers. And then we track that and push that through the entire supply chain infrastructure. Uh, and then we're an open network, right? So we work with all other 
parties. We want software developers to work with us. We want to work with track and trace companies and POS companies, and we want to work with everybody along the way to help empower everyone else's systems. Wow. So what's, what do you find is the biggest challenge for you guys? Because I, I know that obviously the blockchain itself is immutable. Um, the, I, I imagine the biggest pinch uh, point is ensuring that, that the data that gets put onto the blockchain is, is correct. But it at least gives you, if there is something that is off, it gives you a, a place to pinpoint where that happened. Is that right? Yeah. And for us, the, 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 the starting point isn't really that difficult because we, we partner with, you know, uh, Health Canada approved GMP laboratories is, is basically our, our initial base point of who we work with. So getting the testing through is not really the, the big challenge. Really the biggest challenge for us is, is allowing people to understand that, you know, it's, 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 it's disassociating yourself with the noise of, of, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain. And, and it, it's unfortunately kind of like slipped it's under the cracks, right? Recently, mm-hmm. and and being able to clear clear that noise and make people understand that this is this is good for this is good for business. This is good for an industry. Um, and and the exciting part is when we talk to producers and we talk to our stakeholders, everybody starts to get it after they first get through the first bit of the conversation. And we have yet to really get a no in terms of what it is we're trying to provide, because the truth is, pr- producers who are creating good products, they want the, they want the market to know. And they want to protect their intellectual property, and they want to have a safe way to put put their product in the hands of consumers. And you know, and then the other side of it too is that when you're when you're you know when you're looking at a system where you know we're looking at sorry I'm just in the airport now. Yeah, <laughs> when you're no looking at a system where you you know where you're you know you, you're investing millions of dollars into creating products, so like you know it's important to make sure that you know the consumers know you know what it is that they're getting and you know you're making good you're making good stuff right it's like like beyond the, the beyond the organic beyond the organic or non-gmo it's uh you know it's it's uh taking it to the next level right very validation yeah yeah absolutely now so what's the long-term vision with you guys so you guys are um you're already uh you're launched publicly traded on the tsxv vancouver based um, and what you're, you're going to be in the U S soon. Is that correct? That's correct. So we our ticker symbol on the TSX Ventures exchange is DNAX or DNAX.V. There is a DNAX on the OTCs right now. So unfortunately we're not going to be able to get that ticker when we go to the OTCs in about a month, but we will be going to the OTC in about 30 days and, uh, which is super exciting. And then, and then we propel onward and upward from there and, uh, look to expand our, our platform into the international markets, uh, as well as us, but, but first and foremost, serving the needs of the Canadian market, because uh, we see this as a huge opportunity for us to, you know, help, help the community, um, you know, be you know, really great and doing it right. Yeah, yeah. Now, and how are you guys uh, currently preparing for the incoming legislation? What are you doing to kind of get ready for that? You know what, uh, for us, it, it's all about working with the licensed producers. So our lead customer, WeedMD, uh, it's been a leader in the space in genetics and licensing. They work with, they actually work with a number of the other uh, late stage applicants and, and new LPs for starting materials and genetics. So working hand in hand with the people that are, are doing it, uh, as well as working hand in hand with the folks that are, you know, developing the regulations and, and just, just empowering them with, with ideas and solutions. Awesome. Well, so people can now find, uh, there's a full written report on, on you guys and what you are doing. Uh, if anybody's curious, uh, I have a link down below here uh, that is crushthestreet.com slash block. Um, so you should be able to find everything there. Um, you have a website as well, right? Blockstrain.io. Uh, yes, blockstrain, www.blockstrain.io. Perfect. All right. So I'll have links to that, to the, the full report down below, as well as your website. Um, and, and Robert, thank you so much for chatting with me. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you as well. Again, apologies for the background noise and uh, again, running, running through the airport, uh, but out here doing, trying to do great things for the, uh, for the community at large and uh, excited to, uh, to continue to, to put our services out there for, uh, for being able to get good product in the hands of consumers. Awesome. I'm excited to see you guys hit the ground running. Absolutely. Much appreciated. All right. Well, thanks, Rob. Uh, And everybody, thank you very much for listening. Um, Again, check out those links down below to check out Blockstrain and Robert Galarza and what they're up to. Um, I will see you guys next time. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. Please don't forget to hit like and subscribe, drop a tip if you're able to, and share this video. As always, links to everything discussed in the show are down below. And if you'd like to grab yourself a hardware wallet like a Trezor or a Ledger, I've got links to those as well. I will see you guys next time on the BTC Sessions.